Welcome to Sales and Marketing Talk Show. Today we are talking about content marketing, and I have Andy Lambert from Content Cal joining me. And I think Andy has a lot to say about this subject since they've been a content driven company for a while. And you got four years and 35,000 users for your product. So I think you know a thing or two about content. But welcome, Andy. Thank you very much, Emily. Yeah, really pleased to be part of this. So thank you for the invite. Yeah, thanks for coming. And the first question that I always love to ask my guest is like, what is the thing that we are talking about and why it is important? So could you briefly explain what is content marketing and especially why companies should be investing in content marketing? Yeah, the, the definition of content marketing, always an interesting one. I think um, uh, a business explained this really well, and I, I love their, their description of it. So Intercom is a business I respect massively. And the way that they define content marketing is content, then marketing. It's like permission-based marketing. So the way that we typically engage our potential audience through content is about opt-in it's about whether you know do people do we give people enough value through our content for them to follow us to subscribe to something to download something to leave their email address which then lately kind of gives us permission to to market to them so that's that's how i would define content marketing and really it's kind of typical marketing flipped on its head whereas typical marketing which is more kind of acquisition focused you write about your company, you write with you in mind. In content marketing, you are in the mind of your customer and your potential customer, and you're writing with them in mind. And why they should, why people should invest in it is because, well, really, the growth of digital channels is, is clear. In, in fact, one in four purchases, as Visa have uh, estimated, are driven through social media or influenced by social media, which is utterly huge, right? And when we talk about content, we're not just talking about social media, we're talking about any form of digital content. But the reason it's so important, the reason that so many organizations should invest in it is because it's actually some of the stuff that's harder to prove, right? It's the brand building stuff. It's the human connection that content allows uh, a business to facilitate. And it's that building of that most important emotion that governs all sales. And that's the feeling of trust. And really, like that is... Trust is the foundation of sales and content really is the, the main builder of trust. Long description, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it does. And you have been growing through content at Content Cal. Uh, maybe to understand one thing, did you have that one in mind when, when you started Content Cal? Was it like your go-to-market strategy? We will be starting doing a lot of content or did you found it by, by accident, trying different things and just learned it works for you guys? Great question. So, so the very, very short backstory is that whilst I'm one of the founding team, I'm not the founder, so that's Alex. So he used to run a content marketing agency. And he started that agency after being the head of social of Now TV, which is owned by Sky, you know, a subscription uh, TV service. So um, really, this is a business born out of necessity, ultimately working in, in Now TV, um, working off spreadsheets, building content plans like that, then going into an agency, which then I joined, and building content plans for clients, you start to realize all of the challenges therein and you know it really helps when you're starting a business when you really understand what your customers are going through what they're trying to achieve and i think it's really important as a business to to demonstrate your expertise so if we are marketing ourselves that we are going to transform someone's content marketing output and content marketing results you know we we better demonstrate that right so it's 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 hugely important that that a business can stake a claim and then demonstrate that claim it all comes back to that form of trust integrity you know all of those things those values that should permeate a business so knowing your craft has always been a critical part of any business that i've entered and so yeah by by that measure it needs to be a fundamental part of of how we've grown but equally by that same token content marketing is also one of the best ways to grow a business like us because there's just so many channels it's so many it's so ever evolving 
that you're never there's never uh you know you never run out of opportunity to go after for example uh, i'll just give kind of one one little tip because i could talk for hours on the subject but one of the best things we did when we first launched our business was that for every new sign up whether someone was just testing our product or they were a paying subscriber um, we used to give them massive discounts off off content cows so that they would write a review so that was the most important part to start building our credibility because we started to see us ranking for search terms that we could never rank ourselves because other people were writing them. So then that became a strategy, writing to, to people that, that ranked well for certain terms like content marketing tools or social media tools, writing to them, getting them to feature our, uh, our product and they're starting to appear in lots of searches and ultimately using that content to drive that initial growth. So that was the uh, the thing that started it. But it evolved from there. Yeah, great, great answer. And uh, and I think for for many other companies as well, content uh, marketing is actually coming basically call to market strategy for for a company. And I I think on on that one, one one thing that I would love to ask you is if you decide that a content strategy should be your go-to-market strategy, uh, how to get a buy-in from a leadership team on that one? What what does it require? Um, so this this requires a a marketing orientated CEO, and if they're not marketing orientated, a CMO slash CEO relationship that's incredibly tight. Like we we said before, that whole that whole building of a brand um, it hasn't typically been a thing in B two B. Typically, right? Because most B two B businesses they're very sales driven businesses, and rightly so, right? all about leads, conversion, driving sales, fine. And that, that should still be the case. But as our marketing channels get ever restricted, i.e. we can't go to trade shows, we can't get out and network, we need to find other channels for this. And what we've started to see is the evolution of the B2B brand. Drift are a perfect example, Intercom, shining example, HubSpot, shining example, Salesforce, shining example. They're all massive businesses, I get that. Um, but like Drift is a is a is a business that we look up to, we aspire to, because they have really started to write a new playbook as far as B2B marketing goes. Anyway, I digress slightly. But the point is about, about Drift is that the CEO and a CMO relationship was incredibly tight, meaning that Dave, who was the previous CMO, as you know, Dave Gerhardt, and we'll talk about Drift slightly later on in this, I expect, you know, he was given a huge free reign to start choosing the channels that will grow the business. And content has very much been their go-to-market strategy as it has been for, for Intercom. So we're, And we're really starting to see the formation of a brand. The fact that Salesforce can fill out, uh, well, pre-COVID, uh, they could fill out a stadium full of people to, to do Dreamforce is unbelievable. You know, to, to create that kind of buzz for a, for a CRM software, utterly incredible, right? And, and that's what we need to aspire to, to help people feel like they're part of something. To make that, and you know, this this is a it's a sales pitch, and what I'm doing here is basically a sales pitch to a potential CEO, saying like, this is why we need to do it. This is what we should aspire to. We want to build a a brand that is recognised as a true authority in their field. If I want live chat, I'm going to go to Intercom or Drift. If I want a CRM, I'm going to HubSpot or or Salesforce. You know, that's it, and they they've earned that because of the content that they've created, right? So through all of the channels they've permeated. So realistically with, with that kind of evidence, whilst it isn't hard ROI necessarily, and this is the hardest bit, right? Because as a content marketer, or when thinking about content marketing, you're split between two things. You've got you know two types of marketing. You've got your acquisition oriented marketing, which is easy to demonstrate short term results on. So this is your kind of advertising, running display ads, ads on social, whatever. And that's important, but it's only ever going to drive short term peaks. And if you turn advertising off, you get a trough. So it doesn't drive sustainable growth. What does drive sustainable growth is your through organic content. It builds your brand. It humanizes your business. Ultimately, it's the foundation of trust. And as soon as businesses start and CEOs start to realize the power of brand, then the ROI argument of content marketing starts to go away. 
Great. That was a great sales sales speech for, for 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 that one. I, then, when you are good at sales, I, I must ask another question related to sales because I, I'm a sales guy, and every time I I go with the clients, many of them are are asking which channel channel they should go with on their on their content marketing and marketing. And I, I of course have my my answer on that one. But what do you think, Andy? What I should be answering to those guys? Cool. Three answers to this, um, depending on the on the stage you're at. So if you're a business that you don't precisely know which channels are right for you, let's just think about like, let's talk about social for a second. So if you're thinking, right, well, there's six different major social media platforms. Um, which one should I be on? My answer to that, unless you know exactly where your audience are and where you get the best traction from, my suggestion is always distribute as far and as wide. Take your same content and put it on as many platforms as possible. Yes, you can do that through Content Cal, but it's also the way that we've kind of created as much of a scientific test to understand um, what works. Because when you put the same content across multiple platforms, you can easily analyze. It's like a massive A-B test. So you can understand which one's working better than the others. So you can start to see actually you know, we're starting to resonate more on LinkedIn versus Twitter or Facebook or whatever. So like my my first suggestion is always about distribute, distribute wide as you can. Now, the second part of that, which is kind of a bit of a counter to this, is like you're never talking about just social for now. You're never going to be able to be everywhere. Right. So, you know, I'm sure as you do, uh, have profiles on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram or whatever, but you're never going to spend all of that time there. You're never going to maximize all of that opportunity. So that you'll start to see when you start to distribute widely, you'll start to see growth in some areas. So for us, it was LinkedIn, right? So LinkedIn then becomes a focus of, yeah, we still distribute our content wide, but we focus more on LinkedIn, i.e., we're in conversations about marketing and responding to people. We're making sure we respond to every single comment which we got, which we get, which we typically do across social anyway. But we're, you know, the the answers on LinkedIn are much more in depth. We spend much more time with the community because that's we see biggest growth through through LinkedIn, and you know the, the community works well for us. So that's your your kind of two points: distribute wide, focus on one. Point three is about experimentation and is this when we start to think about channels outside of your, your typical social media channels and there is a, at least half a day per week at content cow which will dedicate to experimentation part of my role as we scaled is about trying to explore those new channels for growth so is it using the like google display network is it doing youtube advertising is it working with creators on youtube at the moment, I'm evaluating TikTok and it doesn't make sense. I can't see how we can fit our own brand into TikTok, but I'm looking at working and starting to evaluate creators that we can work with because they've got a following on TikTok. They already know the format. It wouldn't naturally fit our business, but some of the creators that are talking about content marketing on there are doing really well. So it actually makes sense for us to work with creators. So um, and then we start to also think about like um other things like that are evolving that you just kind of want to evaluate like Clubhouse, for example, right? So there's a lot of buzz around Clubhouse. Uh, I can see why uh, based on my kind of initial interactions with it. But, you know, be clear about having a set period uh, of time dedicated to that experimentation because that, that new channel growth is really, really powerful. Uh, and Clubhouse, whilst I don't want to talk about it too much, it's a really good example of that is because you can see the people that are building the businesses that are building their audiences quickly there. Um, and you know that once they start getting momentum in the early days of a platform, that momentum is perpetual. So you'll continue to see these people be ahead of others. So, you know, it does pay to experiment with those new emerging platforms, but not at the expense of the things that's driving growth today, just making sure there is des designated time to focus on it. And the final point about, about other channels, is the power of channels that you don't own the same way i've given two examples already about like us potentially looking more to work with tiktok creators rather than uh, using our own tiktok account uh, and the same way that right in the early days it was all about getting people to write about us on their own blogs the channels that you don't own will always yield more power than the channels that you do so, and that's often misunderstood by content marketers where it's all about like, what content should we put out and put out to our email list and social followers? That is all important. 
but it is as important as thinking about your non-owned channel content strategy. So um, that, that's a huge one. It's been a massive growth lever for us. And um, yeah, curious to know what the kind of channels that come up in the conversations when you uh, when you ask that question, Samuelie. Yeah, it's great, great question. And uh, typically, when when I'm answering that question, I'm actually asking the companies who are your ideal customers and where are those people hanging out? Because it depends so much who are you who are you targeting. Are they on Facebook or are they on TikTok or are they on LinkedIn? So I think that's that's the main question there. Who are we targeting? Yeah, no, indeed. Yeah, it goes goes without saying that that one is obviously the, the baseline of that for sure. But um, yeah. It's always, as you can tell from me, I'm always about evaluation, curiosity, and exploration are always like the, the key, the key tenets of like a, a good content marketing strategy. Always, always evolving it for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I think one one subject when when talking about content uh, marketing uh, is how easily you will find your content from Google and or other other search engines. So. When you are thinking about like how to add uh, SEO to your content marketing strategy, how you should be approaching that one? Yeah, certainly nothing, nothing revolutionary uh, here. There's there's really two things that we do: um, keyword research uh, amongst our two biggest you know search terms, which is around content marketing tools and social media tools. Um, so we spend our content strategy is all built off keyword research, right? So we spend a lot of time doing that and we look at it across our main markets of the UK and US. So yeah, don't forget to think about your keyword difference between different locations. So once we've got a clear strategy around that, so we're looking at search volumes, we've got a big spreadsheet of the monthly search volumes for things like best content calendar tools or best content collaboration tools or whatever it is. We're looking at anything with over 100 searches per month, and we are looking to rank for those. So our blog content is all created around that, ultimately. Our yeah, our entire blog strategy is all built off, off SEO. Sometimes that can be a challenge, actually, because when you write too much for SEO, it diminishes the quality of the content. So that's that's a balance we've kind of flipped, if I'm being very honest, we flip between. Sometimes we've got a little too kind of SEO orientated, and you can tell it's written for SEO, lots of internal links and all that stuff. Um, and it doesn't read as well. So, um, you know, so there is always a bit of a balance of that. But then the other side of our kind of content strategy is using that same kind of keyword analysis. And like I said, uh, right in the beginning, when we launched Content Cal is like working with others, is that we would be looking, you know, search, you know, best content calendar tools, look at who ranks in the top 10. Fortunately, you know, Content Cal ranks typically between five and seven on all of our key searches, which is good, but we do have some massive competitors in our space. So um, within the top 10 search results of all of our, you know, key search terms that that drive real intent purchase, um, uh, you know, for what people are looking for, um, our key search terms, there's always a, a few reviews, like typical like listicles written by maybe agencies or bloggers or whatever um, that rank really highly. So it's our job to try and get those individuals to feature us, which is a really hard thing to do because those really popular blogs get the same kind of message all the time like feature us feature us so we have to do lots of stuff like give away content cal for free you know um i pay for insertion sometimes often don't do that because we want to make sure that the people that are reviewing us you know really see value in it um but yeah we'll give away our product we'll give away our affiliate program you know we have 20 percent like affiliate program so people get recurring commissions which helps you know um so there's our, our two parts of our kind of seo content strategy but then that informs our social media strategy as well so for all of the key questions that people are asking like what's the best way to create a content calendar or how can i create a template for a for a content calendar all of that stuff feeds into our social content because we know these are the most popular questions that people are asking in our market and that through our social content which is very much top of the funnel you know that's the thing to get people in to our kind of ecosystem of downloading stuff and subscribing to stuff um, you know, we, we want to be answering those most frequently asked questions that our potential audience are asking. And yeah. uh, that's it, basically. Yeah, so, sounds good. And I, I think you you have really like found the focus on, on your content marketing. You, you really know what, what keywords you are, are focusing on and going going from there. 
But I, I think for many, many companies, there, there is a challenge that they would love to write on like so many things. And they, they, they are not thinking that, oh, what is the one thing that I want to be known for? So what kind of tips you would give on that one? Like how to find the focus on your content marketing efforts? And if you don't find that one, what, what will happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's a great question, this one. So it's something I talk about a lot because I think it's something that's missed in so many people's content strategies is thinking about what do we want to be known for? Content marketing has an unbelievable ability to humanize a brand. And we've been talking about the word humanizing quite quite a few times today. And um, and that's that's the critical thing. So the, the fact is, this is how brands and trust is built, because they, they start to seem human. When you start to feel something that's human, you start to create a connection with it. Creating connection builds a brand. So in order to do that, we need to be known for certain things and kind of hang our hat, so to speak, on certain things. So I can I can use um, like a few examples here. Like we could talk about like big B2C business like Patagonia, which is all about like ethics, right? Ethical wear, how they source their their materials, the fact that they're now allowing people to kind of recycle their their clothes and be secondhand clothes now being sold in stores. That is very much living your values. And that really permeates content marketing. You're known for something. So for the people that that value ethics and sustainability in their clothing choices, there's no other choice. You go to Patagonia, right? So that's 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 brilliant in a B2C space. But in a B2B place, you know, we, we see some other businesses being really clear about what they're known for. Once again, use my favorite example of HubSpot. They defined the term inbound, right? Which is what we've built our whole business from. It was all built around HubSpot's inbound methodology. And it was a fact that I read so much about HubSpot. I bought a book by their first... Um, sales director, um, Mark, um, what was his surname? And it's a brilliant- Robert. That's the one, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I got the book here right now in front of me. <laughs> good man, good man. Yeah, I, that, that book was the most fundamental one uh, to growth in the early days. So um, what was it called, Mark Robert? It was like- The Sales Acceleration Formula. The Sales Acceleration Formula, that is the one. Um, yeah, epic. I just took so many notes off the back of that. And it's so many learnings you could see applied in how we run Content Cal today. But ultimately, you know, is reading all of that content that made me kind of live and breathe this inbound thing. And that's how we generate, what, maybe 2,000 inbound leads a month, uh, of which we have a fixed, a very reliable conversion rate off them. And we don't have salespeople calling out to people because ultimately you're creating content you're creating a funnel if you will that that brings people to you and it's very much built on that model but ultimately hubspot are known for inbound and um and like very and this is a kind of more early example back in like going to salesforce where it was all about like you know um him going to war mark benioff going to war with microsoft right you know and i yeah. loved it and people it's polarizing sometimes, right? You're either in one camp or the other. And it's and people go with people that are on a mission, right? So you feel you're connected to something. You've had a terrible experience with Microsoft, you're sick of all of these software renewals and all of the like the horrible difficulty that comes with, you move to Salesforce and get rid of all of that. You're trailblazing. Um, and it was that kind of like, you know, don't go with Microsoft, they're the enemy really helps them be known for something. And um, yeah, so that's definitely a, a huge element to consider because being known for something is the foundation of a brand. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, great, great thoughts. And uh, I, I think one one thing that ma many are thinking is like uh, how you should be measuring content uh, marketing for example now are, are you thinking that a, a, every minute you are talking here doing <laughs> doing content marketing you're getting w one lead each minute for for you guys when someone is listening to this episode how, how, how you should be measuring everything you do regarding on content cool um i have some uh, i would say some polarizing thoughts on this and um, not everyone will agree with agree with me but in in digital marketing we are we overvalue an, an analysis massively um, in the sense that it is marketing is part art, part science, right? And we heavily weight the science element because so many businesses make 
binary decisions based on short term data. They'll run some ads, they'll see conversion rate, they'll, they'll split test something. They might have some AI tools which will tell them the outcome of that and they'll, they'll orientate their business all around that. And there are, I'm not saying, you know, none of that's valuable, but you missed all of the, the nuance that happens around the edge of which data never tells you. And the, the sad reality for marketers, whilst we like to think in funnels and think in customer journeys, most of that's nonsense because customers discover you in all manner of ways, because then there's just so many flaws um, that kind of leads to all of the flaws that we see in attribution. Give you two examples. So if, if someone clicked on a Facebook ad a year ago, but then didn't do anything, but then spoke to you and you said content cow's great, so they came to our site and bought it, you know, how do we attribute that? Is it, was it a Facebook ad that did it? Or was it kind of a, word, a word of mouth, a referral? Really, what, what actually happened there? Data will never tell you that. And then, you know, flip it on the, on the other side where, and this happens a lot, right? Is that because we have to bid on our brand terms uh, on Google for, for PPC because, you know, everyone else in our space is bidding on our brand terms because we've got strength in our brand now. So lots of people are just searching content, Cal. Um, so we, unfortunately, you know, Google have us have some handcuffs on us like they do for most businesses. Right. Um, but this this is the point. It's like the fact is someone might have discovered us through whatever channel they've read a review. A friend told them about them, told them about us. They saw us somewhere else, forgot about us, took a trial, read a blog, forgot about us, saw us a webinar. It goes like this. And then eventually they've gone. All oh, right. Someone I've heard about content Cal like 10 times. I need to look it up. They'll search it. They'll they'll click on the the PPC ad um, because they searched our brand term, and then our you know we attribute that to PPC. But it's flawed. It's nothing to do with PPC. Same as the the previous ones. Nothing to do with Facebook. So and it goes to show like attribution is fundamentally flawed because it misses all the nuance in it. So what we need to do is kind of as content marketers is to take a bit of a step back. Now I appreciate. We can't just say, oh, yeah, it's just about building brand and trust and it, and it lives in a kind of fluffy world like this. But one metric that I, I don't see many businesses thinking about when they start to determine success, and this is because this goes more into kind of brand marketers rather than typical content marketers, but we're seeing the evolution of this, is that it, a key metric is share of voice. I talk about this quite a lot, but ultimately, how often are you mentioned uh, in comparison to your competitors? So what, what share of the conversation are you taking? And for me, that is one of the most important metrics because it picks up on everything. It picks up on you know the growth of word of mouth because word of mouth is by far and away the most powerful marketing channel, always has, always will be, just, uh, just a matter of fact, right? Anything that's being said by others will always carry more weight than anything said by the business itself, just how it goes. And that's, that's how trust is built. Um, so with that, you can't measure it. The only way you can do it is measure how how often people are talking about you. So where you can start to see sig significant statistical gains in your uh, share of voice. So you can see people talking about you, mentioning you, whether that's across social, you know, reviews, blogs, whatever. There are some great like social media tools out there that help you kind of listen and interpret that data. And that's known really well. If, if you went, you know, what I'm saying right now is kind of, child's play to someone if you worked at Unilever for example it's just obvious you do this that's what a brand marketer does but you go and speak to a typical b2b business they're like what what does that mean and it's and it's that kind of conversation where we're a bit behind in b2b marketing and we shouldn't be because ultimately the way that we market and the way people buy our products now because purchasing decisions are happening ever increasingly at a user level in a business scenario so actually, we don't need to be talking about like how we market to a business. We don't need to go to a trade show. The way people are making decisions are based on trust at their own from their own perspective. So we need to be thinking about how often people are talking about us because our share of voice is our reputation building. and Our reputation builds trust. Trust builds our brand. And you can see everything falls off the back of that. So share of voice, utterly critical to determine ROI. Yeah. 
Great answer, great, great ideas. Um, th then uh, you guys at Content Call, you, you are like tech company for, for content marketers. But what do you think? Are technologies a must have for content marketers in 2021? Or can you do things without those? No, you, you absolutely can. Um, I mean, the, the vast majority of the, the kind of world that we speak to typically are operating on Google Sheets, right? They're planning their content on that. They're building their, you know, their content strategies on a, on a Google Sheet. And I already said our, our keyword research lives on a Google Sheet. So you don't actually need a whole heap of technology. Of course, you know, technologies exist out there to make this this whole process easier. There are no shortage of them. Um, and whilst, you know, whilst I could use this as an opportunity in a platform to say, you should use Content Cal because it's brilliant. Um, but actually one of the, uh, the most important technologies that I've seen was well, two of them. Um, one of them is available now and it's called Descript. Um, Descript is a transcription tool. So if we are doing like this right now, we could transcribe this and we could edit this video. So let's just say, you know, I've had a few like ums and ahs and, you know, some things that I probably would want to edit out of what I've been saying. We could play back this video, see the transcript, delete the words that we didn't want, and it would edit the video in line with us deleting the words. You know, for anyone creating lots of content, which businesses should be like we're doing right now, they need tools like that because it saves hours of editing because you're doing video and text editing at the same time. Because off the back of that, you've got a YouTube video, you've got a blog, right? Because you're creating both the visual and the written asset at the same time, huge time saver. And then the second thing, uh, and I found this on Product Hunt and I actually just need to, uh, yeah, I've just figured out the name of it. So um, this uses a technology that is going to be so important to content marketers. And you're going to hear lots more about this in 2021. It's called GPT-3. It is a, um, you're, you're nodding your head, so it's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know it, you know it. So I'm seeing loads of products appear on Product Hunt featuring GPT-3 technology. If you don't know what it is, check it out. It's going to blow your mind. Um, because this is, and I have, I've spoken about, and I'm con going to contradict myself here because I spoke about how it's, you know, it's about the nuance and using AI isn't going to tell you all the stuff regarding data, which it won't. But I'm about to advocate for AI using GPT-3. Uh, there's been a product that launched on Product Hunt uh, a few weeks ago. It's called CopySmith. And essentially, it takes all of your keyword research. It doesn't, it doesn't take yours. It just researches a across the web and defines copy based on a whole bunch of parameters, copy for LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, copy for a blog post, copy for your marketing text. Like it'll, you know, it'll put some copywriters out of business, put it that way. But the copy that's being generated through this automatic tool is incredibly impressive. Still early days on that tech, but we're gonna see much more of that. So content marketers are gonna evolve past spending hours editing stuff, like we talked about with the script, evolve past spending hours crafting the perfect piece of copy but spend their time focusing on what channels am i putting this stuff in and how can i continually optimize that focusing on on really the the bit where it needs a, a creative mind less about the bit that that just requires just a whole heap of effort yeah that's actually super super interesting subject my my colleague just wrote a blog post on on that one to our website it's it, it, the blog post is in finnish and i i posted it on linkedin last week and there was many many copywriters commenting that no machine cannot be writing and they were like super scared of their work but <laughs> it, it will come it will take take our jobs at least change them like on some some way as as you described yeah i mean and this this is a whole other big conversation and yeah don't don't get me wrong like the craft of a copywriter isn't isn't going to destroy be destroyed overnight but like any other profession it's going to be it's going to evolve hugely um but put it this way if i was in the legal profession i wouldn't be a big fan of gpt3 right so yeah i think for, for certain industries it's going to disrupt it in a massive way content marketing at the moment is just going to it's going to add value to it um, but definitely want to keep an eye on. Yeah, exactly. But hey, let's move our fast, uh, those are last last two questions. I always ask a question from from our previous guest, and you will ask a question to our next guest. 
Yeah. But now this this spring, I'm I'm changing a little bit this episode, so I don't have a question from our previous guest, since now we are doing the, in the way that Finnish guests are asking the next question in Finnish, and the English one is asking from the next English guest. So I will ask my question from you, and then you will have the question for our next guest. So my 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 question for you is, what do you think about this show as a content marketing? All oh, right. Well, uh, it's great. I've got to say that, haven't I? Um, but <laughs> no, I think it goes back to the point that I um, I, I said a, a second ago. Is like you know, there's there's a whole bunch of value that happens here. So not only we we creating content in multiple formats, and we're doing this really quickly, right? So uh, it's going out on LinkedIn. It's it's a video, and it's going to be a written asset at the end of it, and it's going to be an audio asset. So it's going to be on podcasts. So not only do we have the formats nailed on, that's kind of three formats we're doing in one kind of half an hour session. Then you've also got the the channel opportunity of in it. So you're putting it on on LinkedIn Live. I'll be showing this on my own personal LinkedIn, which obviously it's great for my own personal brand and content, Cal, and also great for you because uh, my followers wouldn't have been aware of your business before. So that's great. Um, so you've got now not only the format opportunity, but you've also got the channel. Um, like distribution opportunity that comes through that. And then we've got the kind of, I would say the most important part of doing things like this in the, in the format of like an interview and a podcast is the people you meet because there's so many collaboration opportunities that come off the back of this, right? I talk about this so much in content marketing. It's been a huge part of our strategy of like how we collaborate with others, whether it's inviting people to guests on our webinars, getting doing like mini courses on content marketing, whatever it might be. You know, all of that, you know, it's strength in numbers, not only because these people talk about you and you get in other people's feeds and you get to share others with your audience. So everyone gets, you know, everyone wins, but you also learn learn so much as a human being, right? And life gets richer as a result of learning from others. So, um, you know, it is it is a win in all ways. So, yes. That's why I'm always, always happy to to do this kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's why. Great, thanks for the kind, kind words. And now, now to last one. So, your question to our next guest. And you were actually earlier talking about drift. And our next guest is Mark Killens, VP of Content and Community at Drift. And before Drift, Mark was at HubSpot taking care of their learning academy. So, I, I think you've been following the things that he's been doing. So. What should I be asking, Mark? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, Mark lives a brilliant world going between my favorite companies. So, uh, yes, it's going to be a great chat with Mark. I'll definitely be watching that. Anyway, with um, we spoke about this earlier, and I think this is the one I want to, to put to Mark. You might need to make this a little more succinct because, as you can tell, I sometimes explain things in a, in a bit of a long way. Anyway, the thing with... Uh, with Drift was that they demonstrated the fact that employee advocacy and being the kind of face of the brand is not reserved for just for the CEO. Dave Gerhardt, the previous CMO of Drift, was very much the face of the company. So he absolutely blazed a trail in for a business that actually you don't need to have to be the owner of that company or the founder to have a voice to be one of the faces of it. The, the same thing has happened for, for me at Content Cal personally as well. But and I think it's a, it's a really important distinction because we are starting to see the evolution of content marketing outside of you know just the core social channels to get a wider a team involved. But the key question here is that th this does create a challenge because Dave Gerhardt left to another business, Privy. So with, with someone that carries that much power in an organization, uh, they, he leaves and he leaves all of his followers behind uh, or takes all his followers with him rather. So for Mark, what's the, what is the future of who, who's going to be the talking head of that business moving forward? Does that change his perspectives of, you know, employee advocacy? Is there a plan rather than to have one individual, you know, very much being the voice of the company? Is it going to be a team orientated approach? Because that's this is a real big challenge for employee advocacy. Great opportunity within it. Dave was critical to to Drift's growth, but as we see, people move. So, um, what issues does that cause? 
Yeah, great question. I will be asking that one from Mark on the next episode. And thank you so much, Andy, for joining. Very valuable lessons here. And thank you for everyone listening. And have a great week and great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Cheers.